Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I am pleased to welcome you to the Trilink Biotechnologies mRNA Basics webinar series. I'm Daniela Ventro, Senior Marketing Manager at Trilink, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today's webinar topic will focus on the importance of and strategies for optimizing your mRNA coding sequence. mRNA Basics is an educational webinar series with a focus on a key mRNA research topic each month. In addition to today's presentation, a question and answer session with our expert speaker will follow. We encourage you to send us your questions during the presentation by using the questions tab located in the panel to the right of your screen. We will address as many of your questions as we can during our Q&A session. The webinar will be archived on Trilink's website and we'll send you the link within a couple of days. More webinar topics will be announced soon, so be sure to subscribe to our mailing list for the latest updates. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Corey Smith. Corey is a Senior Technical Sales Specialist at Trilink and has worked with mRNA technologies for several years, including experience at the bench and as a resource for our clients along the development path of their mRNA-based therapeutic. Corey? Thank you, Daniela. So as Daniela mentioned, I am Corey Smith, a Senior Technical Sales Specialist here at Trilink, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our latest installment of Trilink's mRNA Basics webinar series. Uh, today I'll be giving a presentation and we'll be taking technical questions at the end. Um, as a reminder, please use the questions panel uh, on the right to submit questions throughout the presentation, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can at the end. Um, first, I'll start off with a little about Trilink. Trilink offers all of your nucleic acid needs, both catalog and custom. We offer oligos, NTPs, mRNAs, and we have officially launched our plasmid services department. We aid in the research of our clients by providing support for your manufacturing needs, and we have GMP facilities and the experience in manufacturing these products for clinical trials. Trilink has a state-of-the-art facility that we moved into at the beginning of 2020. It is specifically designed for custom manufacturing. It has ISO class 7 and ISO class 8 GMP suites with class 5 fill finish hoods. We have 15 total suites for our GMP manufacturing projects. We have almost 120,000 square feet of facility space with adjacent expansion opportunity within the building. And we have 50,000 square feet of custom design manufacturing and laboratory space that's specifically designed for scaling up your operations from small scale research projects all the way through large scale GMP builds. And here's a picture of our beautiful new facility that we are slowly trickling back into now. So here you can see a full list of our offerings uh, with a bit of detail for each specific product. I won't go into details for each, but to give a brief overview, here are some of our main product lines. We manufacture NTPs, um, both catalog and custom. This includes modified NTPs often used in mRNA builds. We have a proprietary capping reagent called CleanCap that co-transcriptionally creates a naturally occurring CAP1 structure. And we have the ability to use these reagents in all of our custom mRNA builds. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before, we have recently brought brought our plasmid services department online, and we have 15 GMP suites to aid in your GMP manufacturing needs. Uh, we also have the ability to run analytical testing and development on these builds, which we know is very necessary for both research grade and GMP projects. Okay, so let's get into the agenda today. Um, today we'll be discussing codon optimization, as Daniela mentioned earlier. Um, we'll start with a quick intro surrounding the structure of mRNA constructs, and we'll move into why codon optimization is important. We'll talk through a few methods, and we'll go over some case studies and data showing how it can work in your system. I know a lot of this might be a review for some of you who are seasoned mRNA uh, synthesis veterans, but for a brief review, let's go over so the structure of an mRNA construct. So we can start here. Um, this is what's known as the central dogma of biology. It's the dictation of the flow of genetic code from DNA to mRNA and finally into proteins. Genes or DNA specify the sequence of mRNA or messenger RNA, and this determines the formation of proteins. Messenger RNA is formed through a process called transcription, where RNA polymerase uses a DNA template to produce the mRNA. The mRNA is then used as a template that the ribosome use, uses to generate peptides and proteins through a subsequent process called translation. These are natural processes and they're essential for life to exist. 
Recently, there has been a push uh, to use mRNA as a therapeutic drug substance in vaccines, such as with COVID and with neoantigen or, or personalized cancer vaccines. Um, there's a push for gene and base editing, which is probably most commonly used in CRISPR or, or other base editing technologies, as well as other types of cell therapies. Um, this requires the manufacturing of mRNA to be done in vitro or basically on the bench uh, through a process called in vitro transcription or IVT, which you'll probably hear me reference throughout this presentation. Uh, at Trilink, we use in vitro transcription to produce all of our custom and catalog mRNAs, and this is followed by subsequent purification and final fill steps. So here is the structure of a functioning messenger RNA. Um, messenger RNA or, or mRNA contains a 5' methyl GTP cap, a 5' untranslated region, uh, which I'll refer to as UTRs, uh, a coding region or an open reading frame, often called an ORF, a 3' UTR, and a 3' poly A tail. Each of these components is critical to translation of the DNA message into a functioning protein. So each aspect can have an effect on how well your protein translates when it's transfected into cells or in vivo. A naturally occurring CAP1 structure on the 5' prime end can help avoid immune activation when the mRNA is introduced to the cell. And this lack of immune activation can help to avoid degradation of your construct. This will increase the lifetime in a, of expression of your target protein. Um, UTR sequences can work to increase expression and stability. We generally recommend choosing UTR sequences that are found in highly expressed proteins. These are normally going to be from mammalian cell sources. Um, at the three prime end of the five prime UTR, so at the, at the downstream end of the five prime UTR is a COSAC sequence. Uh, the COSAC sequence you choose can greatly affect the expression of your target protein. Um, at Trilink, we have a proprietary vector where we have a synthetic five prime UTR followed by what's known as a consensus COSAC sequence. This consensus COSAC sequence has been found to really aid in the expression of your protein. Um, Downstream of that, the three prime UTR and subsequent poly A tail are extremely important for the stability of your mRNA. The poly A tail can determine the half-life of your mRNA, acting something like a timer uh, for the degradation of the mRNA itself. And each facet here of the structure of the mRNA can be extremely influential to how well your construct is developed uh, when it's developed in vitro, how well it expresses in cells. So the last component here that we you know, didn't touch on in that previous slide is the coding region itself, or the ORF region. This region holds the genetic code for the protein that is to be made. The coding sequence, or open reading frame, uh, or ORF, is, continues a continuous stretch of codons that usually begins with a start codon. Um, this is usually AUG. It ends at a stop codon, which is usually UAA, UAG, or UGA. The start codon and stop codon signal where to begin and end translation of the protein. So you can see that because this begins at only the coding region, we're not going to be translating the five prime UTR regions or the three prime UTR. Um, these are untranslated regions as the name specifies. Uh, the ORF or the coding region is the region we'll be focusing on today and is often the most important region for optimization. That's not to say that the UTRs aren't also important to optimize, but you know, when we're talking about protein expression, we really want to be optimizing that target protein sequence. So why do we need to optimize your coding sequence? This, in these, in these next few slides, we'll get into some of the reasons you'll want to optimize, as well as some strategies you can employ uh, for your project setup. So here's a, a brief introduction to codons, and there's a nice uh, table on the right giving all the, the codon lists for each of the amino acids. Um, Polypeptide chains are most, are, are most proteins can be encoded in a vast number of sequences. So you can see each amino acid here has multiple different codons that encodes for it. This is due to the degenerative nature of our genetic code. If you look at the table, you can see again that each amino acid is encoded by several different codon iterations. It is important to note that proteins are encoded by specific amino acid sequences, not necessarily these nucleotide sequences. So basically, as long as the proper amino acids are present, your target protein will still be produced. That being said, each iteration can lead to different levels of expression of your target protein, where genes are preferential to specific organizations of codons. There is a codon bias that occurs, and this bias is causally linked to the expression of your target protein. So optimizing the codons in your sequence works alongside this bias and can vastly aid in the expression of your protein. 
So like we just touched on, codon optimization is a type of gene engineering used to increase protein expression and protein yields by utilizing abundant tRNAs. tRNAs, or transfer ribonucleic acids, are a type of RNA molecule that helps decode the messenger RNA sequence into a protein. tRNAs function at specific sites on the ribosome, and there are certain tRNAs that are more abundantly present and recognizable than others. Rare codons can be rate limiting for protein synthesis. So these are would be rare uh, iterations of amino of, of codons to form the same amino acid. The same protein will be produced, but it may not express as well as if you're using more widely occurring codons. Synonymous codons are interchangeable and will not affect your protein structure or overall function. And if you're able to replace these rare codons with more abundantly available ones, you will remove this rate limiting facet of protein synthesis. It's, an important, it's important to note that this step should be done prior to finalizing a sequence. This is one of the initial steps in sequence design that should be done on the front end of your experiments. Uh, you don't want to get all the way downstream where you have manufactured your mRNA, you've done your IVT, your purifications, your transfections, and you're realizing that you're not seeing any protein. And when you look back, you're realizing you're, you're not using an optimized sequence. So it's really important to kind of do this legwork at the front end of your project so you don't get all the way to the end and realize that you've made a mistake and you have to change your sequence multiple times and, and rerun back all the way through that material again. Um, so there's a few strategies that to employ uh, when codon optimizing your sequence. The first and often most popular is to use you know, online software. We'll go over some of that in the next slide. But the second and most might, might not be as widely known is to codon optimize through uridine depletion or modifications to uridine. Um, high levels of wild type uridine can trigger an immune response in transfected cells. So sometimes lowering that level of, of uridine in the, in the sequence itself can really aid in, in the expression. Modified uridines, though not necessarily codon optimized, it's more of a, an a optimization of your IVT reaction can reduce the binding to innate immune sensors during in vitro applications. There is evidence that they can reduce toxicity, leading to prolonged expression in cultured cells. And not only has this effect been seen in vitro, but it does translate to some in vivo applications as well, where modified NTPs can lead to sustained expression of your target protein. Additionally, depleting your sequence of uridine via codon optimization, so choosing synonymous codons for your target amino acid sequence, uh, that doesn't have uridine can also inhibit this immune activation. For example, if, if you look at the amino acid alanine, it can be encoded by four different codons, GCU, GCC, GCA, and GCG. Rather than using the first iteration, GCU, you can use one of the other synonymous codons to achieve the same resulting amino acid while reducing the uridine content in your sequence. When this is done in combination with other methods of codon optimization, such as removing rare codons or optimizing to your cell system, you can achieve some of the best results. We'll go over some of the data analysis portion, um, some of the data analysis in, the, in that portion coming up. So I mentioned previously that there are several online tools um, to go over uh, you know, codon optimization, and these are some of the most popular and efficient methods that we've found. Um, some of the tools that we recommend are Genius Codon Optimization Software, GeneArt Gene Optimizer, uh, GenSmart Codon Optimization, Benchling Codon Optimization, and Inbus BackTransSeq. Um, when using each of these tools, you have the option to specify your target system you would like to optimize towards. Most of us working in the therapeutic landscape will be optimizing towards mammalian cell systems, and often with some of the software, you can specify this even further to different cell systems. Um, also, if you're interested, there are sometimes options to choose different cell systems, such as amphibious cell systems, zebrafish, um, so on. Uh, there's a few notes to consider when codon optimizing. You'll want to try to avoid creating new restriction sites and to preserve existing sites if possible. Um, practically speaking, if you are often design, you're often designing that, that linearization of your plasmid in tandem with your sequence, sequence design, so removing existing restriction sites or creating new restriction sites that cut through your ORF sequence can lead to improper digestion of your plasmid. You'll want to make sure that you're maintaining these basic plasmid elements when you're uh, codon optimizing. The last thing you'll want to do is you'll want to perform an in silico translation of the newly optimized sequence, and that way you can ensure that the same amino acid sequence is being preserved. Um, if there's a change in the amino acid sequence, this can lead to improper protein synthesis and function, uh, essentially introducing an unwanted mutation to your sequence. 
some of the tools that you can use are XPASI Translate. That's one that, that we have used before and it, and it seems to work quite well. So, you know, all in all, some of the benefits, the, those were some of the benefits and strategies for code on optimization. Um, the proper optimization, remember, at the front end of your experimental setup can really pay dividends with your downstream protein expression and yields. Um, the two main methods we talked about, well, three main methods we talked about were um, removing rare codons, optimizing for your cell system, so mammalian cell or, or whatever cell system you're using, and optimizing via uridine depletion. Um, these can be done via the online tools that we listed. So go ahead, when, when, you, when this presentation is over, go ahead and check those tools out and you'll be able to maybe play around and see if they will work for your sequence. Um, okay, so let's move into some of the methods and case studies and some of the data um, of codon optimized versus non-codon optimized cells. Or, or sequences rather, apologies. So this slide uh, is an example. It's, it's a great slide. It's a great project showing side-by-side -side data set from uh, of the effect of optimized mRNA sequences and the effect they can have on protein expression. Uh, in this study, codon optimized and pseudo-U modified mRNA uh, shows significantly high, higher levels of EPO expression when compared to its wild type and non-codon optimized counterparts. Um, mammalian cells usually have G or C as their third degenerative position uh, in the codon, and such sequences are expressed more efficiently than those with codons that end in A or T. This is an example of optimizing your codon sequence for this specific system. This mRNA is specifically optimized for mammalian cells, and you can see with the figure on the left that this has really paid dividends uh, in the when it comes to protein expression. So what we see here is on the left-hand side, uh, there's murine e, uh, EPO introduced to dendritic, human dendritic cells. Here, the left shows uh, non-optimized sequences, and the right shows the optimized. Additionally, the study looks at the effects of wild-type uh, uridine versus pseudouridine. We had mentioned before that the combinations uh, and modifications to uridine, U-depletion, and optimizing of your specific sequence uh, can lead to much higher levels of protein expression, and this is a perfect example of that. Uh, optimized sequences using pseudo-U show nearly twofold higher levels of EPO expression when measured via ELISA 24 hours post-transfection. And both the wild-type uridine samples, both in the optimized and the non-optimized, show significantly lower levels of expression. So this is a, a perfect example of how a simple change to the nucleotide sequence, that, that simple optimization step, can lead to starkly different results. It also shows that that combination effect of using, you know, both the base modification as well as the codon optimization can lead to a significantly higher level of protein expression. Um, on this slide, we'll dive a bit deeper into uridine depletion and how this, how these types of modifications uh, to your sequence as well as modifications to uridine in general can improve your protein expression. So this study here focuses on the difference in protein activity between a standard luciferase sequence with different modifications across the board to a U-depleted luciferase sequence. As a secondary measure, as I mentioned, it, it compares different modified UTPs as well as a few different nucleotides as well. Um, the uridine depletion is performed in the fashion that we discussed earlier by using synonymous sequences coding for the same amino acid. And in each case, the U-depletion of the f -luc or luciferase sequence shows higher levels of luciferase activity. Uh, when paired with a base modification, specifically uridine, you can see that the expression increases even more. Um, in most cases, it's almost tenfold the expression level, um, if not more. You can see these uh, non-U-depleted sequences are barely showing up. They're, they're significantly lower. Um, and then here, the N1-methyl-pseudo-U mo modified sequence is about tenfold less than the uh, you know, U-depleted one. So, it really, really does pay dividends to you deplete. It really does pay dividends to consider using modified bases. Um, it, it, it does help quite a bit. So lastly, we'll go over a base editing example. Um, I know that base editing mRNA has become a massive installment into the mRNA therapeutic landscape. Um, so we can take a look at how you depleting uh, your base editing sequence can improve your protein expression. In this project, we looked at a base editor in both U-depleted and non-U-depleted sequences, as well as 5-methoxy-U modified and wild-type uridine. Um, we compared this against a standard U-depleted cast ion control, and HSP90 was used as a control to ensure the blot was performed correctly. U-depletion is signified by a plus here, and the 5-methoxy-U uh, modification is signified with a plus or minus here. Um, below, 
in the in the gel image we measured or in the blot image we measured the expression you know via blot here so what we found lines up again with our expected conclusions the modified and u depleted base editor is comparative to our cas9 control while the non u depleted and wild type sequences show very low to non-existent levels of expression even at the one microgram level we're seeing expression of this base editor um, when using a uridine depletion and a 5-methoxyuridine it's still showing up at one microgram and at five micrograms and it's comparative to that cas9 control which we would expect to see a, a pretty good signal for okay so we can go over some of the main takeaways here um, these are these are my conclusions and some of the things that i would definitely have you guys thinking about when you're setting up your your mrna projects um, the first is that Codon optimization, again, I, and I really want to reiterate this because we've seen it before where you get to the end of your project and you're not seeing any protein expression, but this is an important step to consider when you're designing your sequence. A lot of times you can find kind of wild type sequences on, on you know, NCBI or, or online, but oftentimes those are not the best iteration of that sequence. So it does really pay dividends to take that sequence and optimize it a bit further. Um, you really just want to you, know, you want to do it before you begin your mRNA production. Um, you know, second, we went through various examples of how to codon optimize, whether it's through the removal of rare codons, optimizing your cell system, or uridine depletion, and this can all vastly uh, increase the expression of your target protein. It's an integral step to consider when putting together your project, and often a combination of each method, as we showed in some of those data sets can really, really yield the best results for your mRNA construct. Okay, um, so that was that was all we have. Uh, this is our, you know, contact page. If you are interested in setting up a, you know, a project with us. Oops. If you're interested in setting up a project with us, here's our contact us address. Um, here is our toll-free number to call if you, um, need a call with a question or you want a quote request. And then here are some of our upcoming mRNA basics webinars, as well as a further webinar in June. So June 15th, we have GMP mRNA manufacturing, um, and this will be at 9 a.m. as well. And then on June 29th, we have streamlining your mRNA synthesis with clean cap technology. These will both be really good ones, so I would not want to miss out. Okay, uh, thank you, everybody. And I think we can get to some of the questions now. Thank you for that presentation, Corey. The audience has been actively submitting questions, so let's get to them. Please feel free to continue to submit your questions. Our first question is, does the use of modified NTPs or uridine depletion affect the yield of transcription? Sure, so for modified NTPs, um, some do and, and some do not. It, it, it's tough to say. We wouldn't expect to see a, a severe loss of yield in this case. Um, with uridine depletion, I would say no, we, we do not see um, a, a loss of yield. In fact, oftentimes yield is a bit better um, for, for transcription. But overall, I would say you're not going to see a, a, a loss of yield for, for the transcription reaction. And if there is any, it'll be balanced out by that higher expression of your target protein. So you might not need as much mRNA to have a better expression in general. Great, thank you. What uridine amount do you consider to be U depleted? Yeah, sure. So for, for our custom constructs, you know, for, for customers coming with us with their constructs, we normally recommend, I would say, less than 20%. I can say that for our catalog pro, uh, products, these are normally U depleted to around 15%. Um, and that's through some of those softwares that we were discussing earlier. But a good, a good goal is to have less than 20% of uridine content in there. Thank you. Next up. Is there any sequence optimization necessary for using CleanCap? So yes, it, it's not necessarily, I would say, a sequence optimization, but maybe a sequence change. Um, and, and the main important thing here is that you want to have the AGG initiating sequence, and that's the CleanCap recognition sequence, immediately following the TATA promoter region. Um, that is the kind of the sequence specific trait that needs to be used or, or needs to be in your plasmid for um, the use of clean cap. So it's, it, it is important to think of that ahead of time when you're designing your five prime UTR. Thanks, Corey. Are there intellectual property constraints with ordering mRNA from Trilink? So Trilink's clean cap technology is patented, um, but we only require a one-time licensing fee upon the time of commercialization for your product. 
during research phase and, and even up to phase one and, and forward, you, we don't need that licensing fee. When you want to take it to a commercial application, that's when the licensing fee comes into play. Thank you. Has CleanCap been used in any clinical trials or in a GMP setting? Yes, it, it has. In fact, um, it's been used in several clinical trials up until now, and it's actually um, CleanCap is being used in the uh, Pfizer BNT vaccine. Great. Other than uridine generally, are there specific motifs that TriLink would advise removing from the coding sequence to reduce immunogenicity or otherwise improve in vivo performance? Sure. So kind of some of the some of the traits we went over earlier, other motifs besides uridine depletion are removing those rare codons um, from your sequence. That can really help to improve translational efficiency. Um, you know, this can be done using those online tools as well as optimizing to your specific cell system or um, your specific, you know, uh, target system that can also really help as well. Thank you. Next up, does codon optimization decrease the innate immune response of your mRNA when introduced to the cell? Sure. So um, uridine depletion is, is one form of codon optimization, and this can definitely reduce the immune response uh, that's often triggered by an abundance of uridine. Um, removing rare codons or optimizing through your cell system, that might not necessarily uh, change an innate immune response. Um, but it will increase your translational efficiency. So uridine depletion, as we kind of discussed, uh, wild-type uridine can uh, trigger a, immune, an immune response, um, but the other types probably not going to have a whole lot of effect on innate immunity, but they will have an effect on translational efficiency. Thank you. Why would you want to reduce the immune response through uridine depletion if you are trying to provoke an immune response with an mRNA for vaccination purposes? Sure. So for some for some vaccination purposes, you are looking to you know stimulate the immune system and create an adjuvant an adjuvant effect. But oftentimes, when you are using mRNA, you know you're looking to trans transiently express a protein. You don't want to really trigger that cell's immune system. You don't want to um, you know increase the likelihood of degradation for your mRNA. So kind of um, you know flying under the cell's immune radar there can actually increase your expression of your target protein it won't create that adjuvant, adjuvant effect that's often needed um, for vaccines but for other applications non-vaccine applications it can absolutely help with your you know expression of your protein thank you what is more important using the most abundant codon or the one with the less urine and how do you decide so I, I think, you know, in this case, there are, it's, it's going to be very, very sequence and protein specific. Um, we found that a mixture kind of of both options there, you know, there, it, you know, there's, it's tough to say which one is more important until you, until you actually run the, you know, the transfection and you see the protein. Um, but I would go with, you know, a mixture of both. In certain cases, you can probably balance that uridine depletion with the, with the rare codons and, and, Take a balance of both there. That, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more. Um, does the uridine depletion affect um, secondary structure of mRNA generating more stable uh, double-stranded RNA? Sure. So, you know, uridine depletion can affect the, the dsRNA formation. Um, again, it's probably going to be a case-by-case -case basis there. Uh, secondary structure is, is, I know, often tied to that, that GC content as well as the uridine content. So um, it will be dependent on each specific sequence. It's tough to say without looking at a, a specific custom sequence. And I know with some of these tools, you can actually do a prediction of, you know, hairpin or, or secondary structure formation at certain areas. So that analysis can be done with a lot of these codon optimizing tools here. Thank you, Corey. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for taking the time to join us and for your questions. I'd also like to thank our speaker, Corey Smith. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the TriLink website and we'll send you the link within a couple of days. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone.